Okay. So you, you would just auto tell me, you know, just say like, okay, can you share? Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Hey everyone. Uh, welcome to episode eight of the Stanford ML Sys seminar series. Uh, today we are uh, very grateful to be joined by Kayvon Fatahalian. Um, I'll just uh, start out by briefly introducing the cast. Uh, so, hey, I'm Dan. Uh, with us, we have Piero and Kayvon. Um, so this week, Kayvon will be talking about uh, the process of rapidly building video analysis models. Uh, so as always, our plan will be Kayvon will give approximately a half hour talk, uh, and then uh, we'll follow that up with a podcast style conversation where the audience can ask questions um, and we'll, uh, we'll summarize and uh, and discuss the questions with Kayvon. So a bit about Kayvon. Um, so Kayvon is my advisor um, and a assistant professor uh, at Stanford University. Uh, so his lab, uh, our lab works on visual computing projects from large scale video analytics to programming systems for video data mining and more. Uh, today, Kayvon is gonna be talking about um, uh, situations that uh, he and some of our other lab mates find, find ourselves in where we often find ourselves as subject matter experts uh, needing to create uh, video understanding models. Uh, so with that, um, uh, Kayvon, uh, feel free to screen share and take it away. Okay, cool. Um, all right, should be good now. Um, okay, well, th thanks, thanks, Dan, and thanks, Piero, and thanks, everybody else for listening. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is, is kind of experiences of, of my students, <laughs> which, which I hope or I assume are, are pretty typical of experiences of other people trying to build models. And I wanted to, to set the tone in thinking about, you know, I view myself and some of the work that we do in the field of computer graphics and image analysis as consumers of ML first. Uh, we are interested in creating new computer graphics uh, applications or new image analysis applications. And, and I'll show you a few of those today just because you probably aren't aware of some of the stuff, but they range from like analyzing images to create new computer graphics to helping designers explore high dimensional design spaces, which is a big thing that you know, any artist does, all the way to finding the right images that one should collage together in terms of stock photos or B-roll to, to create the next movie or commercial or short um, to something that's a little bit less um, uh, generative, but more analytical of, of just, just building systems that can, can make sense out of big visual data. And just to give you a, a sense, um, you know, here's a project that, that we, we recently uh, finished up. Um, it was, uh, so this image or this video that you're seeing is, is from the, the Wimbledon final. Uh, in 2019, it was that epic uh, Roger Federer Djokovic match. And, and one of the interesting things about this video is that I'm actually not showing you the video from the match. This is an entirely synthesized video of a, of a fake point. And if you don't believe me, you know, we, can, we can make a different point where the players are actually hitting the balls to exactly where we say. So now Djokovic is hitting the ball to that red dot. And after he hits, he recovers back to where the blue dot is at the bottom of the screen. So the point here is not uh, about computer graphics and tennis, but, but the point is, is that in order to make these videos, which were constructed by analyzing a large database of broadcast Wimbledon footage, we had to develop some models. Or, and, and actually in this project, we actually ended up hand annotating certain things like, what is a frame where the ball is contacted? one example of, of something that actually Dan is, is working on these days, is we need to know exactly the frame of contact. It's actually a pretty precise event detection problem. And we also want to know, well, is this backhand that Federer is hitting right now, is this a topspin backhand, which this shot is? And if you kind of look at that form and you're a tennis player, you know, if you're a tennis player, you can easily see that this other shot, this is clearly a slice backhand. <laughs> And if you're not a tennis player, that's probably not so clear to you. And if you're a machine learning model, it's a pretty subtle uh, classification problem. So a lot of the graphics we do starts with, we have a big data set, we want to um, annotate it with some semantics so we can start reasoning about it. And often they are fine grained classification problems that pop up. 
Another example is a project that, uh, again, Dan has worked on. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an example of, of needing to create a bunch of different models. So I invite you to take a look at tvnews.stanford.edu. We've been, uh, courtesy of the Internet Archive, we've been downloading video 24-7. We have all of the video of Fox, MSNBC, and CNN since 2010. And by running various uh, models on that video, for example, face detection models, you know, we can produce analyses of the news. Like, for example, here is the amount of screen time faces of Democratic candidates were, were on screen in the early half of this year during the primary. Okay. And people come to us and they ask us questions that we really can't respond to because of, of shortcomings in our ability to, to train new models. Like someone came to us recently and said, we want to know every instance of an N95 mask on TV because we'd like to compare the stations on do they choose different, uh, uh, different people to show. And being able to, to, to detect you know, things on the fly as soon as you get an idea, you know, be able to operate on it, like it was incredibly powerful. Like here's an example of uh, we needed to train a face detector for Trayvon Martin because someone had a question about are the images that Trayvon were used on different stations uh, to cover the Trayvon Martin story, were they different? And in fact, you actually see some patterns. Like for example, the image at the top was the image that was most commonly seen on MSNBC. This is the image that was most commonly seen on Fox. This is the image that was most commonly seen on CNN. So there are some editorial choices being made that automated video analytics can begin to shed some light on. Interestingly, the iconic picture of Trayvon in the hoodie was actually not the most popular photo on any of those channels. So we have these data sets, we wanna do some interesting things with them. And, and that's where I kind of come back to what I feel is sort of how I've done my research is I get interested in making it easier for experts in order to, to do their job. And so I'm really interested in tools that increase the productivity of programmers or artists. And I'm being increasingly getting interested in tools that improve the program, um, the, the productivity of machine learning researchers because we happen to hit all these problems all the time. So what we would like, and what I'm sure everybody on the call would like because it's not you know, particularly unique, is I like my students. These are some of the students that did the work that I just showed you. And they typically have, these are not um, people that don't know anything about machine learning. These are people that are publishing papers in machine learning as well as have uh, deep subject matter expertise in the, in the computer graphics or the, or the task at hand. And so I'm not even thinking about democratizing machine learning right now. I want these folks, when they get an idea in research, like, shoot, if we just had all of Roger Federer's sliced backhands, we could start making this new, um, we can make this new type of point, or we could factor that into our computer game, which takes into account how slices work versus topspin. Or we want to find all the N95 tasks on TV, or something we've done in the past was we want to find all the interviews of a certain person. So with that idea, armed with whatever pre-trained models you want to start with, and armed with a huge corpus of unlabeled data, you know, our, our interest is trying to get to workflows where my students are curating data sets for training, generating supervision by any means necessary, curating data for validation, which is hard for us because we never have val sets given to us. Um, assess performance, hypothesize fixes, and just keep doing this over and over in rapid loops. So we've been thinking a lot about how can we get this process down and our focus has definitely not been necessarily on how do we you know, implement the next compiler or how do we parallelize things massively. Really our headaches are the ones that I hear over and over from everyone else, which is about data set curation, understanding failures and so on and so on. So you know, I come from a graphics background and I kind of think about this as I just wish there was this palette of tools. Like I, I like to use this Photoshop analogy is you know, the space of, of images that I want to create is vast. And you know, Photoshop gives me this very powerful collection of tools that I know if I have this particular problem or I want to perform this operation, I know exactly what to go to. So I kind of, you know, it's not the visual, uh, you know, like I, I'm not saying I want to do this without programming. I'm just saying I would like an API. I'd like some system support to make this easier for me. Okay. So 
in light of that setup, I wanted to tell you about some of the problems we've hit and how we've addressed them in the last year or two. Um, these are, um, and because I think they might be interesting to discuss because I suspect that other people are running into the same things. And, and I personally would be very interested if there are other techniques out there or other solutions that um, are different ways to solve the same thing. And so the key for the rest of the talk is most of the time when we are trying to train a model, and I know this is not typical of everybody, but the models we wish to build are for rare of objects or events or classes. You know, the number of sliced backhands in a tennis match is fairly low. The number of times someone appears on TV wearing a mask, pretty low. So if you had to kind of go mine these huge data sets for uh, examples of these very rare, rare events or categories, you definitely need to do a little bit of work. Okay, so what I'd like to do for the next, you know, maybe I guess 25 minutes, 22 minutes, is tell you about some of the stuff that uh, some of my students have, have just come up with and um, how we've solved the problems and where we're going next. And so I'd be happy to, to hear discussion at, at any time. Okay, so I want you to keep this, this rare category uh, context in your head. And I'm gonna switch away from our unstructured data sets to data sets the community might know a little bit about. So we've been evaluating and trying some of our methods on these long tail image classification data sets. For example, Elvis or iNaturalist. So we're talking about data sets that have some categories that are quite rare, you know, less than 2.02% of the data set in the iNaturalist case. Okay. And most of the time when we're doing our work, it's not like, we have interest in a, a, a 5,000 way classifier. <laughs> we wanted to just detect those masks or just detect those forehands. And so we're actually very interested in the binary classification case, or at least the very low, you know, low N way classification case. And the first thing that we ran into is there weren't very many good data sets out there to actually do research in this area. So one of the things that, that we did was we've created this variant of iNaturalist where we've taken those 5,000 classes of which every image in iNaturalist is labeled. And we've, we've made these subsets, these different label sets where we took most of the categories and we just marked them all as background. So every image in the data set has a label. So we're not working, uh, we, you know, like the whole training set is labeled, except it's extremely background dominant. And I'm gonna use the terminology, we, we use the term N to refer to how many foreground categories there are. So in this uh, table, N, N5000 is the original iNaturalist data set. There are 5,000 categories. Every image has one of those 5,000 labels. <clears throat> to make the background more dominant, we said maybe let's be interested in doing binary classification of one iNaturalist category or maybe 10 iNaturalist categories. And so we made data sets where we pick 10 of those categories or one of those categories at random and reset all the labels to everything else as background. So hopefully that, that makes sense in the context that we are, are working on. So we're working on the iNaturalist data, but we've modified the labels to mimic what at least we believe is a more real world scenario for our own use cases. And just to give you an example, here's, you know, here's a little illustration of some random images from iNaturalist. The column on the left is, uh, is the positive, are positive instances of the category in question. Everything else is a negative. And you see some pretty hard negatives as well as a wide diverse set of negatives as well. Now, we didn't think, or at least I, I should speak for myself, my students probably knew better, is I didn't think there would be much of a problem here. We just pick up the latest and greatest of imbalanced learning techniques, we apply them and we should be able to train uh, classifiers for, uh, for these examples. Now, the labels are, the positives are quite sparse. You know, for 0.02% of iNaturalists, we're talking about only a few hundred positives and 500,000 negatives. But when we pulled out the latest and greatest of the, the category or the learning on imbalanced data sets, either via, uh, you know, rebalancing or reweighting techniques, Techniques that were developed to win iNaturalist, which you see on the right-hand side here, the N equals 5,000 case, they do well. They're, they're much better than standard fine-tuning, uh, which is the first row here uh, in, in, um, in AP and F1. But when we apply them to our modified iNaturalist data sets, so it wasn't just that there was category skew, there was an extremely dominant single background category these state-of-the-art methods didn't do as well. 
and we, we reached out to some of the authors and tried to make sure that we were, we were doing everything right. But we really, as, as N shrank, and the background became more and more dominant. So I'm telling you the background um, uh, percentage here. So as N is getting smaller, the background, the majority of the, the, the percentage of the data that's background is going up. Now these methods all kind of started to fall apart. Okay, so we had a problem that it wasn't even about, even if we had all of the training data, we actually had optimization difficulties with SGD. So we, 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 were, we were struggling for that. And the solution that uh, we, we came up with uh, is actually surprisingly simple and doesn't use any of the reweighting or rebalancing techniques um, that have worked so well on uh, more traditional imbalanced data sets. It's actually quite simple. So, so we took our off the shelf image classification network, nothing particularly uh, interesting about this slide. And in, in this case, I, I believe we were using ResNet 50. Um, and it's got a standard softmax classification loss. And what we did is instead of modify this loss, we just simply added another head to the network. So you can think about it as a multitask situation, if you, if you will. But that other head to the network, need, that other task needs supervision. And so to avoid having additional labels, we just took one of those off the shelf models that's hanging around, for example, an image net category classification network. And we have our trunk try and predict what this auxiliary model would say on all this unlabeled un uh, iNaturalist data. Okay, so it's performing the same task, but we're just adding in an additional loss, which is, hey, in addition to doing the classification task that I wanted, I want you to still, I want you to be able to mimic a, a standard ImageNet model as well. Um, so you can think about this as, well, what's going on here? So you can think about it as a multitask situation where we're adding an additional complementary task to help learning because we don't have a lot of uh, positives. Uh, you can also think about it as a form of model distillation. We are distilling the knowledge in the auxiliary task model into our model. So it, um, <coughs> via, via these pseudo labels. So it's, it's knowledge distillation on a novel data set that the OX model was not trained on. And, and you might be like, well, the ImageNet categories don't exist in, in, um, in the iNaturalist data set, or at least most of them don't. But it turns out that like, if you look at what the ImageNet classification model's output is on iNaturalist, you'll see that the images that uh, this model kicks out for any one category. So every row here is, a, is an ImageNet category label. And you'll see that most of the time, or at least on four out of five of these rows, even if it's not the animal on the left, the actual ImageNet category, everything that the auxiliary model says is the same thing is at least visually similar. At least visually similar. So what, what, what we, like to, we like to call this background splitting because we took this large dominant background where we only had supervision to just say, it's not X, it's not a mongoose, it's not a lizard, which didn't give us a lot of information on both of the data set, uh, on most of the data set. And we add this auxiliary task, which at least forces the model to do a finer grained discrimination of that large background. So if you break up the background category into the labels that a pre-trained ImageNet model uh, kicks out on this data set, you get something that's actually a, a lot more balanced. So that background that used to be 98% of the data when we were only dealing with 100 foreground categories, all of a sudden gets broken up into the thousand ImageNet categories of which the largest of which is only 4.5% of the data. And, and largely that's it. That's what um, uh, the folks on this team figured out was you don't have to worry as much about, about reweighting. You don't have to worry about rebalancing your classes. All you do is you add this additional auxiliary loss that sort of keeps training honest. And the results are pretty dramatic. So the last column here is just adding the second loss. And, um, you know, performance of this model hangs out pretty high, even in extreme, extreme imbalance scenarios. 
And so the fall off is, there's some fall off there, but actually not too much. Like for example, going from zero background with AP 59 or, or 50, if one 52, the well, things are only dropping to about 40, you know, lower 40s all the way to n equals 10 case. And that's 99.83% background. So there are a couple of, of obvious questions we always get asked, like how sensitive to this, you know, like in any multitask situation, how sensitive is performance to the choice of that auxiliary task? Like are they complementary? Can they be destructive? And they can absolutely be destructive and they can actually also be complementary. So we tried a number of different auxiliary tasks, like trying to do places classification or trying to predict random labels or just trying to predict the cluster that if you did unsupervised clustering of all the iNaturalist data, just pick the cluster that an image belongs to. These are all ways to provide pseudo labels. And we actually found that um, you know, just clustering the data into a whole bunch of fine grained clusters according to visual features and forcing the network to predict that cluster worked you know, about as well as, as, as forcing the network to predict the image net classification. And the thing that's been, been very interesting to us is the breakdown on the right. Because if you think about this, this is kind of weird, right? Like I have, I only have a couple hundred positives. I have 500,000 negatives. And when I'm using this auxiliary task, well, I actually get signal on those 500,000 negatives because I'm asked to discriminate the 1,000 ImageNet categories or the 5,000 clusters for all this image data, okay? And if you do that, and so, so there's the question of, well, that's where most of the, the weight of the supervision is coming from. What if we dropped even the main task training and we just pre-trained with this auxiliary task, uh, freeze the features, and then just do a standard uh, linear classifier off of that, everything stopped working. So if we just train a linear classifier on top of ImageNet, our AP was 25. If we did this pre-training with the auxiliary task, froze the features, trained a linear classifier on top of that, not much of a boost. If we jointly train with the main task supervision and the, uh, the auxiliary task su supervision, you needed both. And so we're trying to, to get a little bit of a better handle on why that's the case, because the main task supervision is really only a couple of a hundred positives. Everything else is just this big dominant background. Okay. So that's the, the first thing that we did to try and get over our optimi optimization difficulties hump is it's a very simple uh, multitask solution that requires no additional human labels as long as you have an ox task sitting around that is doing something somewhat related to the classification task at hand. So um, that was our, our first, first situation. Okay, so we were like, okay, we can kind of train a model now in this background heavy regime. So that's good. But all the training I just talked about right now is, is assuming we have full labels on the data set. Right? You know, most of those labels are, are zeros or are background, but, uh, but we did have every data, every po uh, data point labeled. And so since then we've been like, look, we, we can't label all the data. So how can we get by with a much sparser sampling of our labels? Okay. So this goes to the common starting point and, and a lot of the things that, that we do is we're gonna start with a very small number of images that we looked at. You know, see a few examples of, of an image or, or, a, or a video in this case uh, images. And we have this large un unlabeled data set and I'm gonna be like, Dan, go to town. <laughs> Or, or my other you know, students go to town, try and figure out, you know, like start the, the stopwatch, here's five positives, what can you do? Right? And at this level, like we don't have enough positives to train deep model or do anything like that. So one of the ideas in, in this uh, process is you gotta ratchet up the complexity of the model with the data that you have. Right? Um, and so we, we start with some very simple stuff like, you know, take, a, take the centroid of these five examples and use K and N to try and find something else. So, so one of the, the steps here is the, the, the acquisition model that's being used to try and curate more data is actually changing as this process evolves. Starts with something really simple when we get a few more positives, we have the ability to train, train a small linear classifier and so on and so on. And so, so here are some graphs of what we found 
in running this active process. So we went and, and looked at the literature. We talked to some friends. They all say kind of hard to beat uniform sampling in some of these deep active techniques. They po pointed us at any of the margin-based or entropy sampling methods. And in the regime where we care about, which is we only have the ability to label a small amount of data. Remember, this is a grad student in the afternoon. It's the far left of this graph. You know, maybe we can take a look at a couple of hundred samples or something like that. Um, first of all, we're in a regime where um, it's very difficult to train a deep network with a small amount of information, even with background splitting and, um, and, and good techniques. So the thing that struck, you know, that stood out to us very early on is like, you know, in this regime where we're in, the, the blue and the green lines, which are all SVM-based classifiers, are actually beating the, the heck out of the deep model thing. So the question was, was how, do we, how do we get some more data, right? And um, you know, a lot of the folks on this call are very interested in, in various forms of weak or semi-supervised techniques. And so we said, well, the human can only label that much. Where can we, uh, uh, where can we get more, more information? And we, we take it out of the embeddings that exist, right? So <clears throat> we, use the rank, you know, we, we use the ranking of our acquisition model which normally would be to you know, take the top of that ranking and hand it off to the humans. Now we do the opposite. We go look at the end of that ranking, the stuff that the, the, the approximate model we have so far says is clearly not like this. And we treat those as highly reliable negative negatives. So this is fairly, fairly obvious, but this is where I bring, the reason why I talked about background splitting just a second ago is because normally if I have a rare event and I flood my training set with a bunch of negatives, a large amount of negatives and a very small number of positives, I told you earlier, we're gonna have some training difficulties. But with, this, with background splitting, we're able to handle those negatives. We can operationalize them into training a model with a very sparse number of positives and a huge diverse set of machine labeled negatives. And all of a sudden we can start training models that actually give us some signal pretty early on in the process. So this kind of small little trick is bring in the, the, the machines, uh, the, the weak negative supervision and combine it with a training algorithm that can handle huge amounts of diverse negatives. All of a sudden the, these two techniques, which, are, uh, which led to the red line at the top of this graph, meant that our sample of efficiency was a factor of two to three and a half to four better than a number of the state-of-the-art uh, techniques that we were, we were um, uh, uh, suggested to look at in this regime. Okay. So our, our machine supervision, our, our weak labeling is actually for the negatives. It's not actually what, you know, the first thing that would come to mind is that we don't actually take the highest ranking things and, and, and consider them to be uh, positives, weakly labeled positives, because the accuracy is quite poor. Because we're dealing with sparse things. And even in the top 100 or top N uh, ranks, uh, ranking of our SVM model, it's incredibly inaccurate. It might surface a few positives, but most of those are negatives. So we use the machine to do the easy stuff, which happens to be the easy negatives. Okay. Um, so, so putting it, it all together is, you know, there's just a few techniques that have been, um, you know, bolted together to come up with some solutions that are starting to work, which is we use acquisition models that are different from the final models that we were training. There's a lot of good ideas out there in the literature. There's also some work at Stanford on, um, on using lightweight proxy models. This is another instance of, of that. Our lightweight proxy models are really lightweight. They're little SDMs that we can turn around immediately. We go after acquiring many diverse negatives because they're easy to machine label with a high degree of accuracy. Okay. So the human is labeling the hard stuff, the positives in the rare case, the hard negatives. The machine is supplanting with a bunch of easy negatives and we have mechanisms to have SGD be able to take advantage of it. Okay. So, you know, we have a few techniques now and, and now we're starting to try and put stuff together. And, and this is where I'm very interested, especially in, in folks that are building systems like this out in industry, to compare, to compare notes a little bit. So 
we have this idea of, of trying to build a system that gives grad students, experts, the, the tools that they need to really quickly manage their data sets, curate training data, curate validation data. And the vision that we had is that computers are cheap. So when one of my grad students sits down at, at their desktop, I'm gonna assume that they have a DGX1 available to them for training. I'm gonna assume that in the cloud, they can acquire hundreds, thousands of cores in seconds in an elastic fashion to do widespread inference or data mining. And we're starting to, uh, you know, another one of my students has done some work to just figure out where we stand today in that. And we did a simple experiment, which is how fast and for how cheap could we do inference with commodity off the shelf elastic computing? Right? And here's a graph of, of uh, using Cloud Run to do that, which was pretty funny. So for about a dollar or two per minute, and this is not extremely well optimized. There's great researchers around the country, including many here at Stanford, that are trying to figure out how to do elastic computing uh, for these interactive and exploratory, oops, excuse me, uh, exploratory tasks. And so they can do way better than us. But you know, this was a project by an undergrad for a few weeks where we said, okay, if we download Detectron 2 on a DGX1 code unmodified, I'm sure we could do a lot better than that. We get about 90 images per second of uh, of throughput on those eight D100s. For about two bucks per minute, you know, we can beat that by a factor of eight or more using thousands of CPUs in the cloud, which we can get a hold of in about 30 seconds. So this notion that the computer is there not just for, for training, but actually to help the human in these interactive cycles of mining through all this data to find what they, they want is something that we're very interested in. Now, the final idea I just wanted to, to throw in here is that, okay, so one way to start making these feedback loops faster is to throw a compute at it to go parallel. Another way is to be more efficient with our models. And there are many ways to do that. And we've been exploring one way, which I found uh, quite interesting, which is most of the data that we work on is not internet images. It's not a wide collection of videos it's actually fairly, fairly narrow. For example, all of that tennis video, or um, this is an example of um, you know, street camera footage. This camera doesn't see very much. And so it's pretty obvious that I should be able to train a deep network that is overly specialized to this scene, and I can get by with high accuracy and lower cost and save myself a lot of money if I said I wanted to run, um, you know, I wanted to mine through all my frames. Okay. But, it's actually turned out to be a little trickier than you think, because even a camera in one place, outdoors and even indoors, sees a surprisingly large amount of data. So every single time we tried to fit, you know, a, a tiny little model to the data, or, or sorry, to the video speed to run quicker, you know, there's always this question of, okay, how do you how do you figure out what training samples to throw in so that we properly sample all the weather conditions, all the days, um, and uh, and so on and so on. And like even in our tennis data set, in the, over the course of a match, we see non-trivial distribution shift, uh, especially when the sun can go behind the clouds and things like that. So, so we ran an experiment and we plopped down a camera in a new environment. And we said we wanted to specialize tiny models for this camera. And we said, well, how much data is needed to train the model? And while we trained, we, we didn't spend too much time trying to, to pick the data, but we trained on like a couple, you know, few, few days of data. We trained on a couple hours of data and we trained on a few minutes of data. And what was surprising to us was that it's actually the final row. Less data worked best as long as it was fresh. And now if you give it another you know, second worth of thought, you're like, well, that's pretty obvious because it's exactly the training set is matching the, um, uh, the test set very, very closely. And so that kind of <clears throat> pushed us into this world where we'll shoot. Let's just not work very hard to figure out what the right data should be in advance. And let's just build tiny models that can adapt really, really quickly as the distribution shifts in time over video. Okay, so don't worry about careful sampling to get the right data set. You know, just make sure you can adapt quickly online when you see it. So we tried this for, for semantic segmentation. This is a, a task that, the, or segmentation in general, is a pretty important task in computer graphics. Um, we, and, and we built this, this system where we had two little networks, right? We had this big network, the teacher, that was accurate and expensive. We had a tiny little network, the student. So we, we did kind of classic model distillation. 
many people have done something like this. And the only difference is that our model just, uh, you know, we're, we're updating that teacher sort of in real time contiguously, sorry, the, the student in real time contiguously as things, as the distribution changes. And this worked surprisingly well. And I'll just show you a few examples and then, and then finish up is, you know, here's an example where mask RCNN is running on the left. And on the right is the output of a model that is, I think, 100x fewer flops. If you count the cost of training it, it turns out to be out 20x fewer flops. And it looks pretty good. And let me, let me back up for a second and just show you. So when the lady in the blue in the near court walks in front of the judge, you will see this, our segmentation goes badly. So look on the right-hand side. But it only needed a few frames. It actually only needed about, uh, a minute or two, sorry, a second or two of, of video frames using the, the teacher, uh, the supervision from the teacher to correct itself. Right? In some sense, it's kind of overfitting to the immediate future and that's okay because it continues to do so. Okay. And just a few more examples in terms of having a moving camera. I mean, you'll, you'll be hard pressed to find a difference between these two. And a final example of very fast moving egocentric video where we see the camera pivot to the left. In a second here, the segmentation on the right panel falls apart. And with about that much supervision from the teacher, it is corrected itself. Okay. So those are some of the examples that we're, we're trying to, you know, we've built, we're trying to put them together into a, a more coherent system to package them up so that we can use the right tool for the job. And there are many, many different ways to or, or that we can be doing a lot better right like we we're we're really haven't even scratched the surface of how do you index store or organize data for rapid exploration um, we're really interested in how to make the process of validation more sample efficient so we're we're looking into what statistical techniques should we be using to to uh uh, to validate with fewer samples. Because if you're trying to validate these rare events, you have to look at so much data to actually see a few of them. Um, and all of this is, you know, something that I'm very interested in is how do we, there's so much knowledge being carried by the, the human expert. How do we get that knowledge out of their head as quickly as possible? In other words, like, let's not be too clever if the, the human can just tell us what, what the answer is or, or where to look. So on that, I'm sorry, I went like a few minutes over, but, uh, uh, that's uh, just some examples of some of the problems that we're working on uh, today. So I'd be happy to, to, to hear any questions, to have stones thrown at me or uh, anything, uh, anything we'd like to talk about. Thank you so much, Kevin, for the talk. This was amazing and a lot of food for thought. So we have collected quite a few questions between me and Dan. And, <laughs> uh, there's also some questions from the audience. So also, let me remind the audience to, you know, keep the questions coming. We will try to, you know, um, forward them to, to Kayvon in real time. Um, I can actually start from asking you a couple of questions, like for like little clarifications for me, just to, to have a better understanding. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty curious, for instance, um, in the first part of the talk, you talked about this way to um, um, like relabeling some of the um, labels as background, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I didn't get how do you actually choose the labels that are not then considered background? If yeah, you're... sure. Okay, yeah. So that, that's, sorry for if that was not clear. And um, this paper is on archive, so I can, I can push people to that, is, is we wanted to simulate using iNaturalist data what would be like to perform uh, either like a binary classification problem or, you know, a 10-way classification problem. So we, we picked at random out of the 5,000 categories. Let's say we picked 10 of them. I see, I see. And everything that we didn't pick is background. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. Because I thought that there was like, um, you know, uh, losing them by their frequency or something, but no. No, no. I mean, there were a few things we, we did just to, to run reasonable experiments. Like there are some categories that just have so few positives, you, good, good luck. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a such a low shot scenario. So we did eliminate categories that were, so rare that it, it was kind of hopeless. Got it, got it, got it. And, and I, I can't recall what the range of category frequencies is. I see, I see. Thank you so much. Because yeah. like, I mean, really for us, it's, it's a lot of the, 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 the idea to let's see if it's there, they're all binary problems. 
Mm -hmm. And you don't have this luxury of, of having label sets sitting around for all these other categories most of the time on real world data. When we downloaded the tennis data, we had nothing. Got it. Got so, it. So this is like reflects pretty well what it is, like a real world scenario. I mean, it reflects our scenarios. Now, yeah. I imagine Facebook, Google, like they do care about, look, you know, there's 10,000, 100,000 things that could be in this image. Please, please perform that, you know, about 100,000 way classification if, uh, when an image comes in. You know, actually, I feel like there are some, like maybe, I think they also have this kind of scenarios because, you know, there's, uh, a new meme then is pretty offensive and they will have to you know at least for the time before they collect enough examples of that meme for instance uh, mm -hmm. by that time they will probably need to they will, they will be in that kind of situation where they actually are and another case where it arises is usually when you are debugging your models. Yeah, right. You are looking for specific instances like Matei and, uh, and Peter at Stanford have the, or I believe, okay, I can't remember the office, they have the, the model debugging work that, you know, they're trying to find these events that are like, that's suspicious in my model. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's another place where, you know, it'd be nice to be able to rapidly, you have this hypothesis about why your model's terrible and you want to iterate on that as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So I have another curiosity, uh, or, or Dan, maybe if you have a question, you please go on. Oh yeah, so I was just gonna, uh, you know, following up on the, on the discussion um, there. So Sahan Asiri has a question in, uh, in, the, in the viewer chat about what additional challenges do you face when the tasks are highly specialized? Um, so for example, when you're looking at something, a specific domain like tennis, um, as opposed to something that has a lot of categories in it, like iNaturalist? That's a good question. I mean, I mean, one thing is, I mean, I like to think about it more as an opportunity, right? Like there's all these ways you can cheat that you wouldn't be able to if you were trying to win a, a standard benchmark or, or try and interpret the world like what, what some of the companies need to do. Um, you know, some of the challenges though is, you know, in general, harder tasks you know, help you do the simple stuff as well. Like for example, in the, in the background splitting, the main idea is that it's kind of too easy to know that something's background. It's so rare that you just say background all the time, you're always going to be right. So you actually have to challenge the model with something harder to get it to preserve any kind of useful information. Right? And, and so sometimes that's kind of the, the, like the lack of diversity means that, that you really overfit and then all of a sudden, you know, the next match comes in or something like that. And, and um, the other thing that, that we have in a lot of these computer graphics applications is that graphics sort of has a, you know, catastrophic failures are bad kind of thing, right? Like if you make one little error on one frame, you just can't ship that. Um, and so one of the, the problems that we have is, is just trying to get to, you know, 99.999, you know, so that you don't have to look through everything whenever you, uh, like for us uh, in a number of sports scenarios, um, we have situations where just something as simple as segmenting out the athlete when there are people, other people directly behind them wearing the same color of the clothes is, is a surprisingly hard problem that like I would have thought like, um, you know, like most people probably think it's not that interesting. Like segmenting on a person robustly, you know, we're pretty good at that. And like, yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's hard. So uh, one thing that you mentioned, uh, I, I, I also had a question about. Um, so, so you mentioned uh, some of the differences, I think, between machine learning and kind of graphics applications. Um, I was wondering, you know, uh, I think you have a lot of experience uh, over the past uh, over your career about the intersection between systems work and graphics work. Um, I was wondering what similarities do you see today about the intersection between systems and machine learning? And what do you think that the MLSS community could, could learn from uh, uh, the, the years of systems and graphics uh, uh, collaboration? Yeah, no, th thanks for asking about that. Cause that's actually something I feel pretty strongly is, you know, cross disciplinary work is something that we love to say in academia. <laughs> and, and cross-disciplinary doesn't mean that, you know, someone gives me a model and I use it for my task or my application. You know, like to me, cross-disciplinary means 
both sides have to learn a great deal about the other side. And so we have that problem. I mean, it, it's just hard. Um, you know, sometimes being cross-disciplinary means that you're the worst of both worlds. You're not an expert in anything. Um, sometimes it can mean you're, you're the best of both worlds and that you actually can speak like an expert on both sides and then, therefore you're the only person that can connect these dots. I think that the problem that I see and you know, one thing that we had in computer graphics well before me, you know, look at Pat Hanrahan and some of the early founders of graphics is that they were just both excellent at systems and they were excellent at the math. Like they were world-class in both. So the culture of the field was never, oh, performance is just engineering. Um, it was performance and systems thinking is tightly intertwined with the math and good solutions will pick the right, you know, pick the right solution for the application task. And there's plenty of that in the ML community, like, like people sitting on both sides of the sense, but there's also a lot of folks that kind of see themselves as one side. Like they're gonna take the machine learning results as is, and they're gonna try and speed them up. It's a benchmark. Or, you know, people bending over backwards to like, come up with complex topologies where maybe just brute force or writing the, you know, writing the code correctly or getting QDNN to optimize a couple of those layers is, is uh, just a better way to do things. And so um, I hope that the community, the, the community really continues to uh, prize the work, the hard work that doesn't quite fit into both bins. And, and I think right now we're, Sometimes when I see some of the, the conferences out there, I, I feel like they're choosing one of the two sides. You know, you see stuff in systems conferences, you're like, no machine learn, learning researcher would have done it that way. You're optimizing something that's not even close to optimal. You know, you see machine, you know, you see computer vision or machine learning researchers go, yeah, like you're, you're fighting over these benchmarks, but I mean, why? What are they representative of and everything? And so you know, just, just be thoughtful. Thanks. Uh, as your student, I will take that advice to heart. <laughs> and I, I'm sure our, our audience uh, uh, also appreciates the, the sage wisdom. I think that's uh, advice even for people that are not your students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we had a couple of questions uh, in, in the audience chat about um, applying some of the work that you've talked about in this talk to different domains. So uh, Jonathan Selman uh, is thinking about highly imbalanced audio data. And I oh, think cool. in, in reference to background splitting, uh, cool. Simran was asking um, uh, so for, for a different paper for, for the Gen Network, um, do you see differences in, in, a, in amount of data um, that you need uh, for, for different types of tasks. So I, I was just curious, you know, maybe a, a, in a broad yeah. way, uh, have you thought about applying some of these things to other domains? Um, no, we, we haven't because um, like, like one thing that, that we are rightfully criticized all the time on is, is that some of this recent work is kind of done on one data set or something like that. And, and we're, we're absolutely rightly, rightfully criticized, but it can be incredibly hard to have to create your own data sets <laughs> and also do the work. <laughs> um, and so, because you're, you're actually also penalized for it because if you do that and you release a data set, then people say, yeah, but I don't really trust the result. I wanna see it on all this other standard stuff as well. And so we, we've had a little bit of a struggle because we are creating these modified data sets because we are trying to solve a different problem than what those, the existing data sets are, are setting the competition up for. Um, and so, so I, you know, we've thought about even in the visual domain of trying to work on other data sets, but um, we were like, yeah, none of them actually test the scenarios that we're, we were interested in. I personally have not thought at all about audio uh, or other things. Um, I don't see any, you know, big reason why the, the broad strokes wouldn't apply. Um, you know, the idea of, of don't think about hard, Day, you know, hard fixed test sets. Think about you're constantly learning and constantly updating. That seems like a, a good idea. Um, the notion that you should bring in additional supervision in clever ways, and one clever way is, is via this form of uh, auxiliary distillation. That seems like that would be a, a technique that I'm sure many other people have done in, in situations that I'm even not aware of. 
Um, but we're, we're pretty ta task driven. Like we are, we're trying to build some tools that we want to use. And then if there's not an off the shelf thing, we, we try and innovate. Um, and so the, the students that, that did some of this work, I want to give a shout out to a lot of the work that I talked about today was actually done by a student of mine back at CMU named Ravi Mopuli, uh, and also a student that was started at CMU has moved here to Stanford, Faye Palms. Uh, and then the undergrad, uh, Mahir did a lot of the work on Cloud Run. I'm sure I'm forgetting some people off the top of my head. Um, but uh, a lot of the focus on this narrative today is, is their work. And I really encourage folks to reach out to them because um, uh, I think, you know, they, they benefit immensely from feedback. Oh, that's great. Actually, Kevin, there were a couple of questions in the chat, but also a couple of questions that I saved myself about the, uh, I'm curious about how do you see this distillation process? Because in both the first um, uh, part of the talk and the second part of the talk, um, the distillation was one of the main ingredients to make actually the systems work. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, like, like the way I, I imagine, uh, the way I see it is that it feels like it's a, uh, something, what happens is something in between uh, a way to avoid the catastrophic forgetting, but mm -hmm. those models are trained from scratch. Mm -hmm. so there's not actually something that they had learned beforehand, right? So there's not, there's not something to lose, like, but. Well, well there, there is actually, and the background splitting for sure. And, and actually one thing, you know, in this informal talk, I didn't do a proper lawyer work, but if you, if you look at the learning without forgetting paper, they have exactly the same solution. In there. I see. Exactly the same solution. So their goal is to keep the N minus one classification model around so you don't forget the N minus one categories when you train the next one. Exactly. Okay. You know, our goal is never to not forget anything. Or you could say it is. You could say that something's been learned in training ImageNet. And keeping that around would be useful. So in that standpoint, it's exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. But we came at it completely from, we are label poor. Like from the context of our task, there is nothing to forget. Mm -hmm. But in training on our sparse set of labels or that skew, we find that off the shelf SGD destroys the representation that you have sitting around if you're fine tuning from, from something. Right. And so in that sense, yes, you are trying to not forget that. And so it's not surprising that we arrived at a similar solution. Yeah, it makes sense. And I think at the same time, you know, another possible way to see it, another possible interpretation is maybe that also provides a formal regularization. Yeah, that yeah. that's another way to think about it. Points everything, you know, mm -hmm. that yeah. maybe. Yeah, you could say that like, you know, off the shelf in this category skew is just going to destroy your representation. So you don't want to forget it, right? Um, and regularization is one way to do it. And how do you regularize without any extra, you know, knowledge or any additional human labels is, why don't you just try and predict the model that was trained, you know, try, try and mimic the model that was trained to produce those features in the first place. So you're, you're clearly not going to forget something if you still give the same output as it. Mm -hmm. So maybe in this sense, you know, what could be interesting is... It's a very roundabout way of retaining the information. Right, right, yeah. right. But at the same time, this is making me think that maybe you don't, probably you may not need the classes. Maybe you would just, if you keep the last representation to be close to the last representation from the pre-trained model, that yes. work as well, right? Okay. So um, the Ravi who, who did this work is, is, you know, he's very clever about what are the parameters you want the user to change. So there, there's prior work on, look, I want to have like some rubber band that keeps my, my features similar to what they were before, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And then you got to worry about, well, what's the coefficient of that elasticity, right. right? Right. And that's a very meaningless parameter. Whereas in our system, all you have is one parameter, which is what's the relative balance of the two losses. Mm -hmm. If you want to forget more, then crank that down. If you want to forget less, crank it up. Right, right, right. Or, or the opposite. I think I said it backwards, but you, you get the point. And so this like lambda that is just the balance between these two losses is something that you can kind of get your hands on as the, as the hyperparameter tuner. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're like, look, I want to maintain some distance, like what is the right distance in feature space that's too much? Like, right. It, it's sort it's of completely good. unclear what, how you would set yeah. those thresholds. Yeah. And I think that one last aspect about this, this, this thing is um, 
with respect to the second part of the talk, the one like um, when uh, you update the model um, with like windows of, of like um, with fresh data, right? Uh, continuously. I think yeah, okay, that, yeah, okay. that, um, I can imagine that the model, um, it, it's a really interesting setting because I can imagine that in that case, uh, the model may actually forget about the things that absolutely does before, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but because those are not relevant anymore, it's a, actually a good forgetting, right? So. Correct. Yeah. So, so that idea is: look, as long as you can relearn quickly, don't worry about forgetting. Right. Right. Okay. Now, now, of course, there's there's obvious what if statements on that, like you know, you move around the corner, how long does it take you to re-remember, you know, what it looked like around the corner, and so. Um, you know, maybe this isn't for mission critical kind of stuff, <laughs> but, also, um, but keep that around, right? Yeah. So you can imagine, and the, the question we always get asked, the work that we did not do, <laughs> <laughs> and the question that the, the, the student that did this got asked in his thesis proposal <laughs> is, you know, what about memory, right? And there are a bunch of different ways you could do that, right? Like I could literally, the systems -y way is I just checkpoint the model from time to time. And, and then I just pull one of them back from a cache. Now another, the more ML way to do it is I'm gonna maintain a, uh, a much bigger set of training samples than just the window of the last half second. And I'm gonna be very careful about what I allow, what I retain in that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, yeah, I mean, there's, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. And, and again, it's like, if you know that forgetting is, is a big problem because you're, you're walking around in circles or something like that, then I don't think you would exactly do it the way. Right, right. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you so much. But if you have a slowly evolving data distribution and you're more than confident that your model can train faster than the data distribution can, uh, can evolve, then it's, it's really clean, right? Like you just don't worry up front about what are all the things I might see over the next three days, who cares? Just, just let it go. As long as your teacher is robust enough to handle all those situations, which is a big, big if. Right, right, right. right which is a really big, big assumption. Hey, Kayvon, I caught the tail end of your presentation. And uh, one thing that, that caught my eye was that um, application with the body camera or smart glasses with okay. the, the basketball example. And I was kind of wondering, what are the other restrictions and constraints of building out a kind of system where you have this remote device um, yeah. and a teacher living, you know, maybe somewhere else? You know, how do we know when we want to activate the teacher? Um, how do we recognize this kind of domain shift when we know we want to put in another specialized? Model? Yeah, like yeah. So like there, there's so what we use are kind of all the the standard techniques about like look if the if the student starts getting confused, you should fire up the the, um, the teacher, um, we have various forms of exponential back off or kind of like your standard networking protocols for that kind of thing. Um, you know, what, what concerns me the most is like, if we actually tried to systematize this is the first thing is like, well, even though you very rarely run the teacher, you might run it every thousand frames, you know, real-time systems are worst case kind of things. So you don't want to have a system that's 99, 99, 999 quick frames and then one with latency of a second to run NASCAR CNN or something like that. So that could be bad. Um, uh, and the other thing is like now all of a sudden I have to build a system that can run the teacher even if most of the time it's running the student. Okay. So I was kind of worried about this. I was surprised when we, when, when we talked about this a lot of, a year ago, a lot of the system builders were actually not as worried about it because they were like, look, you're just going to run the teacher asynchronously somewhere else. And then, you know, whenever you need to run the teacher, that's going to be in the cloud or that's somewhere else. And you just view the, the student as a, a form of compression, where in the same way that like in a video stream, I burn more bits when there's, when there's a lot of information. Now, if there's more information or error, I'm actually going to burn more training. And so the bits I'm burning are the gradient updates on the training. So the, you know, you just send one in a thousand images back to the server you'd run the teacher and student pair on that and then the gradients come back. So I was surprised where people thought, oh yeah, it'd be pretty plausible to implement this. I, know, I, I feel like we, you know, we're introducing some system complexity that makes me uneasy, but. Yeah, I guess I was also thinking, you know, one teacher can support maybe a thousand students or so. Oh, easily, yeah, exactly. Um, like a, a lot of the, you know, one, one thing I suggested to uh, uh, one of uh, Matei's students who's, who's working on a lot of model serving 
uh, is, uh, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting scenario to consider in your model serving schedulers because they're all trying to, to you know, balance these latency throughput trade-offs and on, on cloud-based mm -hmm. model serving. Well, one way to, to balance that trade-off is actually you're just, it's not about a, yeah, it just adds more to that decision space, which I thought could be kind of interesting. Cool. Yeah. So uh, I think we're reaching the, the top of the hour now. So I, I want to get in one more quick uh, audience question. Um, which was uh, the, the first question that, that was asked, I think, early on in your talk, uh, I think after the bit player stuff. So Divyansh uh, Tarari is wondering, um, uh, do you have any thoughts on the detection of deep fake videos? Ah, I, uh, well, okay, so I'm not an expert on that. I'm gonna stick my, my foot in my mouth if I try and be an expert on this. Um, there's one thing that I, I wanna say is, People, if they are producing technology, should be very mindful and be very careful of the implications of those technologies. So in the specific case of the Ventu player, you know, I don't lose a lot of sleep at night about recreating Roger Federer on TV. But we've had extensive discussions in our other projects where we're annotating faces and even gender and TV news and things like that about how, what labels should be available to the public, what should we be doing and what we don't. The one thing that I think is important to add to the discussion though, is that vid to player, the main synthesis algorithm is not a GAN, it's not deep learning. We, do, we use deep learning to change the lighting conditions a little bit. It is video textures 2000 SIGGRAPH. It is essentially Mortal Kombat, like from the nineties. And so, you know, the deep learning helps us kind of normalize the lighting and do a few things. But I do think it is important to state that, you know, some of the technologies that we're using are very, very old. And it's important to, all, like, I don't believe that the deep fakes change the conversation as much as people like to make it sound. It is a serious issue. It is the, the, the harms that people can do can be done with older technologies as well. And we need to be very vigilant about that. Yeah. But that was not a deep, you know, that's not a deep fake project. <laughs> there's, there's no game. Well, there's only one game there. And that's the only, just to make the lighting look okay. Everything else is nearest neighbors and follows a paper from 2000. Right. Cool. Well, with that, uh, uh, I think we, we'd all like to just say uh, thanks, Kayvon. Oh, um, thanks, Dan. And thanks, uh, we'll also at this point, thank the audience. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you're still watching, so, uh, uh, so well, this is actually the, the last talk of this quarter, um, but we'll be back in January uh, with more uh, exciting talks. So uh, a lot of talks on scalability and efficiency of deep learning models, um, a lot of talks on the general uh, ML ops pipeline. Um, so uh, go check out our website, mlsys.stanford.edu for more information there. Uh, and there's also a link to our mailing list on the website and in the description of this video. Um, so be sure to check this out. Uh, and also remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, with that, we'll say uh, goodbye to the audience. So everyone wave goodbye. Yeah, have, happy holidays, everybody. Everybody take a break. <laughs> and take a break, everybody. <laughs> with that sage advice from Kayvon, uh, I think- we'll This is the guy who got one hour of sleep last night. <laughs>